I'm Bill Pence, Director of Film for the Hopkins Center, and I'm also a co-founder of the Telluride Film Festival in Colorado. Peter Sellers is one of the most remarkable and unique talents in the arts. He is consistently creating works in theater, opera, music, film, and performance that engage and provoke. Peter remains firm in his belief that the arts are a collaborative event and that those arts have the ability to change the world. We are deeply grateful to the Montgomery Endowment for Peter's residency. This is a rare opportunity for Dartmouth students and the community to interact with one of the most open and inspiring artists of our time. When you came to Telluride, uh, you know, about 10 years ago as a guest director, and your job was to pick some of the films and present them. Um, I was really surprised at your incredible knowledge of the movies and your appreciation of them. I mean, I'm, you know, I had heard of you in opera and theater <laughs> and music, but you do not think of Peter Sellers in terms of the movies. Where did that come from? Where did you learn about it? Well, for one thing, film is so much more exciting than theater when I was growing up. So my idea of how to direct a piece of theater was to make it as much like a movie as possible. And mm -hmm. I, I had several experiences that were really utterly life-changing. One was um, the year before I came to college. My mother moved our family to Paris. She oh, Cinematheque. Exactly. She, my mother did not speak a word of French. She had never been to Paris, and she said, we're going to live in Paris for a year. We were on a Pittsburgh public school teacher's, half of a Pittsburgh public school teacher's salary. So we had no money. We had couscous every night for a year. <laughs> and I lived in the Cinematheque. And there were the films I wanted to see, and then I just didn't move from my seat for the others. You know, yeah. and so gradually that created a whole film culture, and again, a whole body of work of what the Cinematheque chose to show. And of course, my obsession, one of my obsessions is silent movies. And the Cinematheque had the silent uh, room. And so every night there would be two silent films that would be incredible. And of course, across the days, that was one of the only places in the world you could see Vertigo uh, mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there was just a whole body of film that I absorbed before going to college. Then I got to college enrolled in filmmaking immediately, had a very unpleasant experience with the uh, instructor, and thought, well, maybe that's not going to go very well, and transferred in the middle of the term into Alfred Gazzetti's freshman seminar on Godard. Mm -hmm. And we did Vivre Sa Vie mm -hmm. for 15 weeks, frame by frame, mm -hmm. just discussing one movie and tracing every reference. You know, like mm -hmm. it's a masterpiece by Titian. You know, mm -hmm. you just, you're just you exploring, you know, the tiniest dimension, the x-ray of the canvas, you know? That, 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 that was the first sketch, you know? This, the reading list was 30 books. Every reference Godard made, we traced. You know, it mm. was 15 weeks on one film. And that just simply changed my life as to what a film was, what's going on in a film, how many layers are there, and of course, in the process, I'd seen a lot of Godard at the Cinematheque, but then I filled in my missing Godard links, you know, that year. And that obsessed me. And then at Harvard also had a, a, another a great teacher, uh, Bill Rothman, who was teaching, you know, all of early Hitchcock and these four-hour classes on the Griffith two-wheelers. You know, oh and, and going <laughs> going into incredible yeah. detail on the steam back with a Griffith two-reeler, you know, which was right. exhilarating. And so I, my film culture at Harvard was then, in addition, the Harvard Epworth Church and uh, amazing uh, Reverend Ed Marks, who would show every week, you know, to see Dark Victory with Kurt Jurgens in Cinemascope in a <laughs> church in Cambridge. <laughs> who would imagine? I mean, it was, it was, you know, the, the kind of missing Nicholas Ray, you know, pieces. Sure. You know, you could yeah. see those. You know, there was a complete Douglas Sirk retrospective. There was, there was, it was such a profound film culture. And it was really difficult to see those kinds of movies. At that uh, time. At that time. At that time. You know, now. Now it was, and in addition, my mother taught at a private school uh, in Connecticut. And uh, I got through that the catalog of Janus Films. And we began ordering films 
for my <laughs> vacations. And so to I fill would, in the blanks. yes, and I would just watch a film every night, you know, yes. but we would project it, you know, in our home because we could get the projector from the school on vacations. And so we would project, you know, Ivan the Terrible, all of its parts, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> night after night. And, and I could really memorize some of these films. I could really live with them. You know, it wasn't just going to see them in the theater, but we would, you know, thread them up and go for it. Now, I should also, I don't want to underestimate Andover because at high school, I mean, it's an amazing thing to go to a high school that has a larger art department than most colleges. And Andover has the Addison Gallery of American Art, you know, right there on campus and had a amazing program in filmmaking. Uh, and I did animation, pixelation, you know, uh, all kinds of, I was, my, my job for four years, because I was not particularly into athletics, was to work in the audiovisual department. So I was showing films, you mm -hmm. know. For and feeling a, for, them. And touching them f for a living. And the other thing I would just mention is growing up in a puppet theater, because I started apprenticing in a marionette theater when I was 10. What was very important in the puppet theater at that time was pre-recording the soundtrack putting all the voices and music on tape, and then working the puppets of the tape. The audience didn't realize the show was pre-recorded. So I got into splicing tape. I got into sound and image being, having these shifts, having these the contrasts. The, the mechanism of cinema. The sheer mechanism of cinema, of the separate soundtrack, and editing a separate soundtrack, and then creating another image track. And so that was very much how I was wired. And, mm -hmm. and so all of these things flowed into that. And, the, um, and, then, and then, of course, I was, uh, I was very fortunate because early on I was hanging out with filmmakers. And so, you know, one of the first people who was a tremendous figure in my life was Fred Wiseman, you know, mm -hmm. who lived oh, yeah. in Cambridge and just, you know, opened a universe. And hanging out with Fred and his particular doer sense of humor, and but also sense of what film could do that nothing else could do, mm -hmm. was go into places that no one else can go into, you know, and be there, and really understand presence. So talk about Tarkovsky. Ah, oh, well, again, <laughs> has, 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 like has, Fred, has, waiting, like Fred, just the actual sense that until you finally slow your metabolism down, you're not yet present. Mm -hmm. You're on your way to somewhere else, but you're not yet here. And what does it mean to fully be present here? Tarkovsky um, uh, really came into my life um, pretty profoundly when I started working with a, a, a set designer, George Sipin, who uh, grew up in, in Kazakhstan uh, with his family, was one of the exiles because they were they were part of the inner circle around Lenin, and then uh, sent out to the gulags. and And George grew up, you know, out out in Almaty, uh, in the kind of nuclear tundra, and um, eventually went to the architecture school in Moscow. And then was his family was part of the first boatload of Soviet Jews in the Carter administration, hmm. and he came to NYU uh, to the design program, and he was so advanced, people said, there's this student who's not a student. And word went out that I should go meet him and see his work. And in fact, I did hire him to do my first productions at the American National Theater in Washington, D.C. at the Kennedy Center. Um, and this aspect of Russian culture is because at the end of uh, my year in Paris, I went to Moscow. Uh, with the Union Internationale de la Marionette, and the Soviets were put on a kind of big display. Uh, puppetry was very, very alive in the Soviet satellites because, in the, in a place like Almaty or uh, or 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 Kyrgyzstan or so on, or even Latvia, the actual local language was not permitted to be spoken on stage. The national theaters were all in Russian, mm -hmm. and the puppet theater was in the original language. Mm -hmm. And so the poets, the, everybody was working in the puppet theater and the great writers, the great musicians. And that was an extraordinary view for me of the Central Asian republics, of the, the, uh, the Baltic states, 
and also I have to say the Balkans. I mean, there were things from Romania and and of course the amazing avant-garde movements in Czechoslovakia and Poland. And it was through Czech puppetry that I moved into Czech animation and then figured out the avant-garde um, in Czech cinema, which of course was connected to the puppet theater with Shadow Puppets and you know Svankmeyer and this incredible link from puppet theater into the avant-garde cinema mm -hmm. came mm -hmm. from my visit to Russia uh, in uh, the end of my year when I was 18. And then when I went to Harvard, I specialized in Slavic subjects, and I was obsessed, you know, obviously first with Eisenstein, and once you've had all the Eisenstein you can eat, you have a little indigestion, and you need to look for another way of editing. And of course, Tarkovsky is what emerged. Mm -hmm. And my, my trajectory through Russian subject matter, I, I was particularly focused on Mayakovsky and on the art of the Russian Revolution you know, in college. And, you know, it was exciting. It was, you know, put this together with that and you've made a new thing and, you know, this juxtaposition and, 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 and shift of everything in the world. And, um, and at the same time, that was, you know, the late 70s, uh, you could tell the world was not going to shift that way. In okay. fact, in fact, that it would take more than juxtaposition and restructuring, but that what had to be restructured was the human being itself was you actually, it was the soul force that was missing. You could manipulate the outside world and it was still just the outside world. It was the same old ugly world. And we're always... Talking, we're talking about the soul now. We're talking about the soul. And you know, with, with Eisenstein, <coughs> you know, it was this political activism, but in fact, the reality of Eisenstein's life and the art itself is politics always breaks your heart. Politics is never fulfilling. You pour yourself into it, and some awful thing comes out of it. You know, and you have your little moment of victory, and it's over in the next 10 seconds while you watch the whole thing go south. And so you need to find something that we have as artists that isn't going to go south, that actually is sustainable, and where you're putting something out there that will last beyond our generation and because we're not going to live to see the world we want. So you have to send a message to the people who are not yet here <laughs> of somebody witnessed certain things here and somebody attempted certain things that are not what you read about when you go back through the microfilm of the New York Times, are not what you see when you go back at the television broadcasts of the period but something else was happening that didn't show up on the official record, and that was human beings living lives of a kind of depth that doesn't show up on the media radar. And the only proper response to the shallowness of the world is that depth. And so, entering the zone of Tarkovsky, uh, first with Mirror, which... Well, that was your first? That was my... Step one. Oh, what was an introduction! Mirror. Step the one. The best one first. <laughs> Step one was mirror, and I, you know, and I again because that was my 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 want. I memorized that film. I just I just said I I need to take this film in, of course, because I was also in my studies of 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 I was studying Russian poetry all the time. I was obsessed with with a poetic structure, mm -hmm. not just a political structure for film, and. Mirror was the most overwhelming po poetic structure that you could come from reading Akhmatova into a film like Mirror. And you said, mm -hmm. oh, right, the tradition of the Russian poets is what will survive all this. You know, Akhmatova's poems will survive the years of the Gulag. You know, something will remain after all of this, after all that violence, after all that destruction, a few things actually remain that were not incinerated, and they're poems. And so Mirror for me was this uh, incredible moment in cinema, and coming to it from Godard, you know, the editing didn't disturb me. I was, you know, at home with, you know, the surprising cuts and abstractness, but what was shocking was the spaciousness, mm -hmm. the, the sense that we're not done yet. 
the sense that, no, wait a minute. And that memory lingers and is not going anywhere. That the memory is now going to be with you your whole life and will only deepen. And it's not going to be that memory is put in its box, but your mind and your soul don't operate that way. The memory expands across your life of that one moment. The memory of that one moment turns into a huge, ongoing, underground river in your life. And that stream. I tend to think of Tarkovsky as a stream. Exactly. <laughs> that, and literally, the, 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 what we have to understand and what you know, cinema is, is flow. And understanding what it is, this flow. First of all, this deep well, the pool, the, the deep well, this sense that, you know, the mirror of the mind, which is this, you know, ocean of consciousness. But also just this deep well, this deep source that you just go further and further into and drink from. And so this idea that film was not just about consciousness in the sense of, uh, you know, the, the, what Bill Viola would call the stopping mind, you know, mm -hmm. uh, 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 and what you get from, you know, Godard's two or three things. But in fact, you could calm your life down. You could linger. Linger and actually step outside of history. and be part of a much, much longer, longer stream of human aspiration. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't show up in history books. The way I now think of it, um, and the kind of image always in my life, because I go back and forth between this kind of public service jobs, which you're doing because you have to be a good community member, and we have to contribute, and we have to make something shift in the public sphere whenever we possibly can, of course. But I, the image I always have of the Chinese scholars from the you know ninth century or the thirteenth century, where you're called to service in court, you know you serve in court. There's some you know nightmare invasion of an army from the north, and everybody is discredited, and you have to go into exile, and you're living in some mountain stream, you know by some mountain stream in a little hut, <coughs> and for the next ten years you write three poems, and then. You're called back to court, you know, the court changes, you're, you're back in, you're rehabilitated, you know, you're back in the court. Again, the whole thing turns into a nightmare, you leave, you're back in the mountain stream, you're back in the little hut, the next 10 years you write three poems. And 10 centuries later, all that stuff you did at court, nobody has any idea what that was. And those six poems are part of the history of humanity. You know, for me, that's, that's really moving. And I do feel Tarkovsky's work yeah. as by that mountain stream, those 10 years, when you're not in political power. And I think it's just important not to underestimate, you know, those years, the Soviet years, where Tarkovsky represented something that was unspeakable and there was no official language for it. Mm -hmm. And it had to exist in a side corridor and wasn't in every cineplex, so to speak. And I think right now, you know, I'm, so many students ask me, well now, can't, how do you get your, your work in these big cineplexes and, you know, and really influence the most number of people? And you think, well, actually that mountain stream is looking very good. <laughs> 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 and if you have the patience, the way in which Tarkovsky influences you, or a beautiful Tang Dynasty poem, is not this quick, okay, I'm going to change my brand of toothpaste. Okay, I'm going right to CVS now, and I'm going to buy Crest. But the change it makes in your life is like all meaningful change, gradual and deep and probably imperceptible until years later. And Let's make a seismic <laughs> shift in thinking here. Um, a couple of years back at the 50th 
uh, San Francisco Film Festival, you, you delivered a lecture on the state of cinema. I'm assuming as it was then, and probably hasn't changed much <laughs> today. Can you summarize oh the state of cinema today? Well, I think one of the most uh, exciting things is digital technology, which lets people make film in Africa or, or, or the Arctic. You know, where, where, where it's not primarily money between you and the equipment. You know, the equipment has come down in, in, in cost, and so the impulse to bear witness and to create narrative, you know, now has a digital uh, uh, um, uh, a possibility that, you know, it's not that you have to change the mag after seven minutes. You, you actually, you know, a, a, a storyteller can speak for hours that you can actually take the time to watch a flower open. You can take the time to watch the seasons change. You, you know, all of that time that we recognize from Tarkovsky, which is also, you know, part of um, experience that film by itself was unable to touch because, you know, film had to keep moving and the technology was such that it was very, very expensive. You know, the old thing that you're, you're painting with money and it's quick dry. And so you, you have to really um, have a very elaborate strategy in advance once you start embark on this. Digital creates another type of set of possibilities. And because you can edit anything on your computer on a laptop, it really does create a, another possibility for the democratization of the art form. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think you know, film history is primarily through Hollywood, you know, concentrations of big capital. And, <coughs> and then a few alternate places where they were able to gather some capital or siphon off, you know, a little side stream. And, and you know, and, and, and it gradually moves towards greater and greater concentrations of money and power. And, and so film tells the story of money and power frequently. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what you're looking at. You know, you can taste the money and you can smell the power. And, and if that's your favorite taste and smell, then you're welcome to it <laughs> if you're interested in something else. You know, the digital world doesn't give you image quality. And, and for me, that's a, you know, the part of me that loves uh, master drawings and engravings. And, you know, you appreciate the texture of a juror. There's no substitute for just beautiful no. old-fashioned film. I'm Nitrate sorry. Nitrate film. Just period. Just, just yeah. there is z no substitute. And so for me, part of me, I'm an insane purist, and it's one of my obsessions with early cinema, is this sense that the image quality is so refined and is so um, rich and dense. Um, and so the trade-off to the pixelated universe is a difficult one. You know, and I don't mean to say that film and video are the same. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Film is much more uh, a record and engagement of the visual world and, and is like an etching, something that occurs across time, you know, and gradually creates literally an impression. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas film uh, whereas v video is the opposite. It is pure electronics. It has nothing to do with a visual image, but it has everything to do with energy. It's the electricity senses the electricity, which is why on TV they have to show the energy center of a human being. You know, why on video a landscape or your left foot make almost no impression. You know, a landscape needs film to make an impression because film can actually render the subtle nuance and, and, and density of a landscape. A landscape on video is boring because it, there's no energy from it. And so the electronics are searching for energy and can't find it. You know, when finally something moves, you, you know, think, oh, over there. But it's a, it's, it's a kind of like a, 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 a three-year-old's idea of what's interesting. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and because it's just picking up energy, it makes some of the most memorable video images, images that as images visually are poor, like a man standing in front of a tank in Tiananmen Square, you know, a shot 
from two blocks away. Boring. Boring, out of focus, you know, and yet the video is electrifying because mm -hmm. what the video camera is picking up is the electricity of the moment. Mm -hmm. And video is actually responding to the, the electrical energy, the spark. And so video is at its best in sports, in, you know, in all these things where there's this kind of energy release going on. Mm -hmm. And, and, and in a very kind of dynamic interrelationship. Film is contemplative. Film is stepping back and looking more deeply and has a different kind of repose, has a different kind of, you know, longer view. And also because, you know, you've done several takes to get there, you know, it mm -hmm. means that it's this, not that. It's, it's, it has a kind of refinement. Now, we're in a bizarre period where the transition has been trying to make film as much like video as possible. So if the camera's whizzing all over the place and you know, everything is, right. is yes, focused on action because that's what video does. And they're trying to make it more like video, which is just a, a strange thing to do with film. And now, of course, everything in the commercial film is moving digital. Um, you know, for economic reasons, but I think also because of this, this sense of instant adjustability and... Um, I also think that's what young people are accustomed to today. They're very comfortable with that kind of energy. Uh, no, and I, 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 think, I think what's great about the internet now is it's going to move in both directions, because you can spend one whole day just drifting in the internet, which takes you to a strangely Tarkovskian place, <laughs> which is nothing's happening. <laughs> and yet you're having a very rich stream of experience. <laughs> and, and, and so I do think that the kind of action film mentality, like anything, after you've had too much of it, you're looking for something else. You know, and the pendulum always swings in human events. And you know, we now have all the action films we can eat. You know, I think the resulting indigestion will, will create genuinely a search for something else because the internet universe is at such high speed, and I think it will create the space for slowness. And maybe quiet. I, for me, it's a value shift, and it's the reason slow food is so important right now. And people are taking the time to grow things and to cook them, and not just to nuke them. And I think that, hmm. that you see people eat differently now in America, that you're seeing that's a choice, because growing something takes time. Growing something takes patience. Growing something requires attention. Growing something requires a positive engagement. And, um, and you don't just get instant results. You, you have to, um, your life changes as that tomato unfolds. <laughs> and, <laughs> and when you eat it, because you took so long to grow it, you don't just scarf it down. You know, there's a different sense of your relationship to the taste. You taste it because you grew it. And I think that sense of people's senses being sharpened by slowing everything down um, is what we're going to see in this new generation. You know, now that the internet can take care of running around, I think that's actually going to create a space mm -hmm. for not running around. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be great? Mm -hmm. New Crowned Hope, um, which involves more than film, a lot yes, more yes, than yes, film. Yes, no. uh, We're showing uh, the films of New Crowned Hope here during your residency. Uh, but tell us about that whole project. And well, uh, the, it's just one of the most amazing moments of my lifetime, I have to say. I spent my 20s working on Mozart and, and working on Mozart's three uh, operas that he wrote with De Ponte, the Magic, F the Merger Figaro, and 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 Don Giovanni, and and Cosi Fan Tutte, and literally, I started with Cosi Fan Tutte when I was 21, and when I got to be 30, we filmed all three of them, um, put them on video in in, in Vienna, in at the ORF uh, in Vienna. So it was 10 years really working on those pieces year in, year out, over and over and over again, really going deeply and having the chance, um, which is what is great about classical work, of 
you know, mostly the same casts over and over again, saying, well, last year this moment was really funny, but maybe there's something poignant about it, and we should maybe take it the other way and make it unexpectedly sad. Or this sad moment that we've made so tragic, in fact, it's ludicrous, and why not, you know, also show the absurdity of it? You know, and so mm -hmm. we could, mm -hmm. across nine years on Don Giovanni, ten years on Cozy, we could just keep calibrating, keep layering, keep creating a, a kind of really finely woven tapestry. And that's great. You know, it was like my class on Viva Sa Vie for one, you know, one semester. It's just to, how, how detailed can you make a work of art? How, how satisfyingly layered can it become? And so bizarrely, when it was Mozart's 250th birthday in Vienna, they thought, oh, Peter Sellers. Oh. And they, <laughs> they, they, they called me and asked me to create a festival for the 250th birthday year. And I said, fine, as long as we don't play one note of Mozart. Because by then, Mozart was becoming a commodity, you know, music for elevators and expensive hotels, mm -hmm. that, you know, wasn't what Mozart was about. And this music is powerful, not because it's a good tune. I mean, the tunes are really good. But because it's music of a kind of compassion, after somebody's done something horrible to you, you find a way to offer back to them something generous. So it's not nice music. It's music of the most difficult thing to find in yourself is that moment where I'm not going to do to her what she did to me. And so the gentle beauty of Mozart's music and its violence comes from that. It's not a box of Kleenex. It's not, you know, lovely or nice. It's hard won. The most difficult thing on earth is to actually find a generous response to a world that has not been generous. And that's what Mozart spent his life doing. So everyone says, oh, he died so young, what would he have done next? So I thought, OK, let's test that. Let's ask that question. And so I took the works of his last year. And his last year is a very special year uh, because you know the three De Ponte operas that I'd worked on were basically the soundtrack to the French Revolution. Marriage of Figaro was saying, there needs to be a revolution, folks. Hello. Don Giovanni was the actual fires and violence and rape of one class by another. And then Cosi Pantuti is the bitter aftermath of the world should have changed, but how come we don't feel any better? How come nothing feels better? And that bitter aftertaste of we made all the changes and we're still stuck here. How come it's not a utopia now? And then Mozart had a real crisis because he couldn't get work in Vienna because he had shown his political stripes and he was not um, employable. And he was an economic migrant for one year, leaving Vienna and traveling to Mainz and all these other cities looking for work. And there he was like the Michael Jackson of his time. I mean, famous kid. He couldn't find work anywhere. They all said, oh, loved you when you were 12. You know, and thanks, nice to see you, bye. All the royal families he visited just kind of, you know, received him, and he left empty-handed. What was touching was all these 17, 18-year-olds would cluster around him because <laughs> mm -hmm. they really knew his stuff. <laughs> that was really touching, and he was an old man at 35. <laughs> and anyway, he went back to Vienna empty-handed and uh, began this last year of work, which was no longer revolutionary, but was like Shakespeare after, after King Lear, where you have to find a way to recover because you're so angry and you're so disappointed. You have to start again with a fairy tale. You have to find a way to make a happy ending that's not a lie and invest it with something that is real. So he starts with magic flute, and he creates this magical world. And what we forget is we're here on Earth to transform. We're here on Earth to change. We're here on Earth to become something, not to be who we are, but become what we're becoming. 
And so transformation, this idea of magic, is actually the deepest thing in our lives. And it's not some crazy, superstitious thing. It's, it's real. You know, we are surrounded by miracles. And most things that's happened to us are actually miraculous. And just this texture of magic, this texture of transformation, this question of the trials by fire and water of a young generation. Let's take that as a theme. Clemenza di Tito, his last opera, written at the same time as Magic Flute, is about response to terrorism. Act one. The president is assassinated and the terrorists set the capital on fire. Act two. The president miraculously recovers, says, bring me the people who did this. Big terrorist roundup that brought in front of him. And he forgives them, deals with their issues, and invites them to join the government. Because until these people have both responsibility and representation, no one will be safe. Now, I thought this, I was invited to stage this in the 80s. I said, that's too utopian. It's ridiculous. It's not even dramatic. And then Nelson Mandela became president of South Africa and formed a government with the people who tried to kill him. And you realize, oh. And finally, Mozart died working on his Requiem. And this question of Requiem ceremonies for the dead in a time when, in our lifetimes, there have been more genocides than any previous time in the history of the world. The disappeared, the undead who no one will take responsibility for, and the kind of threnody for an Africa where the World Bank removed from the national budgets of country after country doctors and clinics. And then the AIDS epidemic hit. And Africa had no way to respond. What can we say for that, you know, just the sheer numbers who are dying of AIDS mm -hmm. at this moment? What is the requiem in our generation? What will be the ceremonies for the undead in our generation? So I invited artists from around the world uh, to respond to those three topics. Magic and transformation, truth and reconciliation, and ceremonies for the dead. And I invited people from parts of the world that are coming through genocide and civil war. Cambodia or Chad, or Congo, or Paraguay, and where the political structures are not in place to turn the page of history. And therefore, culturally, there has to be a way forward. And I, I, I wanted to work in architecture, film, and food as the art forms that I wanted to privilege. We also did opera, of course, because we had to for Mozart. Mm -hmm. We also did visual art. But I really wanted to focus on um, new building, new structures. I wanted to focus on food, which is such a moral question right now, as well as a question of pleasure, mm -hmm. and on film. Because architects, chefs, and filmmakers are usually part of the service economy. <laughs> They're not treated as artists. Hmm. They're not commissioned as artists. It's whatever you can negotiate <laughs> mm -hmm. with your best idea of a client. You know, and in fact, I wanted to commission those sets of people just as artists, the way Picasso would be commissioned. You know, I always remember Godard, you know, uh, when people were attacking him when we worked on King Lear, he would said, well, you know, Fine, have someone buy this film and put it in their vault in Switzerland like they do a Picasso. <laughs> 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 but just the idea that a filmmaker could be commissioned as an artist and there were not strings attached. And you didn't have to just negotiate every step, but you could actually make the film you wanted to make. Now, as you know from Telluride, I, I've been part of the film world in a certain way, but really on the edge, and I'm allowed to go in and out. And the two festivals that I've been associated with are Telluride and Rotterdam. And I would always go to Rotterdam because, for one thing, I, I work a lot in Holland uh, and, and uh, in the Holland Festival and so on. And, and the Rotterdam Film Festival was, was close by. But also, Rotterdam was where the deals are made because of the Dutch have all these foundations. So the deals mm -hmm. are made for African, Arab, and Asian cinema.
mm -hmm. and Latin American cinema. Funding. The funding. Mm, right. The funding comes from there. And all the funders are meeting in Rotterdam. And the Rotterdam Film Festival has the broadest selection of films from these parts of the world where there is no money for a film in Argentina. There is no money for a film in East Africa. Right. And so the money has to come from Europe. Mm -hmm. And the funders cluster there. And so I started attending the Rotterdam Film Festival simply to meet that generation of filmmakers who were working in Africa and had to move back and forth between worlds to sustain their practice because the economy uh, in Southeast Asia just would not support independent film. Even commercial film was no, really fragile. Of course. So that's where I was able to meet Garin Negrujo or you know, a whole range of really interesting filmmakers. In those years, the, the director of the festival was Simon Field. And uh, Simon had a particularly good relationship with Chinese filmmakers, with certain filmmakers really trusted him, and he used his position as the head of the Rotterdam Film Festival to support and highlight and showcase work from these parts of the world. And uh, then he was out of a job. Politics in Holland, like everywhere else, um, there was a shift. and. Uh, that was when New Crown Hope was coming into my world. And I thought, well, actually, Ooh, what an opportunity. we should commission film. Now, I had been the head of the Adelaide Festival in Australia. And one of the things that I did when I was in Adelaide was I had to say, you know, what are the indigenous art forms here? South Australia produced in the 70s a whole raft of Australian, new, new Australian cinema. You know, mm -hmm. and those Australian films from the 70s, financed by the South Australian Film Corporation actually went around the world. So when I went there as the director of the Adelaide Festival, I said, we're going to commission film. And I was able to work with Bridget Eichen at SBS, and we commissioned five feature films, of which three won a lot of awards, and one, Rolf Here's the Tracker, is a just classic for the ages. Yeah. And we also did a complete festival of Aboriginal cinema, and for one week gathered all of the major Aboriginal filmmakers and showed the body of work of four decades. And so my connection in Australia to all of that, and of course then because of Telluride, I could invite, for example, the Nunavut people from the Arctic, uh, you know. Uh, fast Runner. The Fast Runner. I invited Baman Gobadi. I invited a lot of filmmakers to Australia to meet the Aboriginal filmmakers and to create kind of exchanges of what people working on the land were doing with cinema, you know, in this new generation. Mm -hmm. So all of that flowed into uh, my Rotterdam experiences with Simon Field and New Crowned Hope. And so I asked Simon Field if he would help curate uh, six film commissions for New Crowned Hope. And, uh, and I also um, worked with uh, Alex uh, Horvath uh, at the, you know, uh, do you know Alex at no. all? No? God. <gasps> Bill, you have a joy ahead of you. Alex Horvath runs the, f the, 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 the film museum in Vienna. Uh, he inherited it from, uh, you know, crazy Peter um, uh, Kubelka. And, and, uh, and so it's always been this abstract, really interesting, edgy uh, place to see film. Uh, in any case, we, 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 cr we went through, we created lists of filmmakers and began approaching them. And commissioning a film is a little tricky because people have complicated schedules, people are moving in and out. We had our own short list of people we really desperately wanted to work with. Some of them were not available or couldn't come up with a project on our timeline because when you, we were commissioning a film, we needed all the films to be ready by a certain date. Mm -hmm. And um, ultimately, uh, every film was financed very differently because making a film in each of these countries was very different. But ultimately, we ended up not working with European or American filmmakers because we felt they were well represented already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't need a program like Surely. ours. Yeah. And so could we create another platform for a set of people whose names people didn't yet know? And yet, in the cinema world, were kind of the bright stars, you know. Up and coming. Up I mean, and coming, yeah. exactly. So Mohamed Saleh Haroun, you know, yeah. film yeah. lovers know that this is a man of profound integrity. And each of his films is in its way a kind of 
beautifully, gently crafted classic, you know, and will endure through the ages. And so Harun, for example, would be Perfect. immediately at the Perfect. top of our list, you know? And, and what it meant to help finance what he's doing in Chad, you know, that was very, very important. Um, uh, we tried to get some geographic representation, of course, we, you know, across the world. Um, some of our plans didn't work out at all. Um, you know, it was tricky to deal with this subject matter from, for example, a Chinese filmmaker working in China under this government and the kind of shifting weather patterns. And so we ended up with Simon Yang, you know, the kind of brilliant, dangerous, wild, bad boy of Taiwanese cinema. But what was so touching was in making this commission, it let him, for the first time in his life, actually acknowledge that he's not Taiwanese at all, but was born in Kuala Lumpur. And he went back mm -hmm. to where he grew up and made his first film in Malaysia and actually touched his roots. And, you know, his Taiwanese films are these wild, brilliant confections, but they're the kind of film that immigrant makes. Uh, you've got to impress everyone. <laughs> and you've got to mm -hmm. be more brilliant than anyone else. And so I surprised everybody by creating a quiet, intense, very, very personal film for New Crown Time. And I think each of the filmmakers took Mozart very seriously, which shocked me. Because I said to each filmmaker, please don't worry about Mozart. It's fine. Pursue you know, your situation and your reality and make the film you need to make. But these are the themes. We're these are the themes, but every filmmaker took Mozart seriously. Mm -hmm. Every filmmaker absorbed themselves in Mozart and in some way couldn't understand Mozart or created a Mozart for their own terms. But for example, someone, uh, someone uh, like Epichet Pong uh, or Sethical Mozart is not his idea of the music he listens to at all, you know, or his generation. And yet, strangely, he could make something that was a lot like Mozart's last piano concerto. Mozart's last piano concerto, the, the theme, Longing for Spring, mm -hmm. returns about 300 times. <laughs> it repeats. It's a rondo. It just comes back and back and back and back. And I actually commissioned Mark Morris to choreograph it for New Crown Hope, and it was the mm -hmm. only actual bit of Mozart that we allowed in the festival. It was a little surprise on the last night. A uh, confection, maybe, a little icing on the cake. And Mark did an extraordinary, extraordinary choreography for it, and of course found out that that little theme that repeats a hundred times never repeats. It's always different. There are always these subtle changes and shifting in the phrasing. And Epichet Pong's New Crown Hope film is this amazing repeat that doesn't quite repeat, mm -hmm. is a feeling in life you've been here before, and at the same time, nothing quite matches. Mm -hmm. And that, that kind of haunting lyrical space where you start looking around you and you say, this is awfully strange. This feels very familiar, but that's what makes it strange. <laughs> <laughs> and so the strangest thing is someone like Apache Pong, who's not interested in Mozart, created a film that had this Mozartian dimension of gentle, a gentle quality, a kind of lyrical quality that was simultaneously comforting and very eerie and odd, and at the same time sunlit and beautiful. So I think it was very interesting for filmmakers to think cross-culturally and, cr and across disciplines. And to, in imagining Mozart, I mean, Harun, for example, with Darat. It was perfect. Which is so perfect. And he, those long takes, he said he was imagining Mozart music. Darat has not one second of music on the soundtrack, but he wanted the takes themselves to be lyrical and musical. And they were. And they were. And each filmmaker had their own response. Uh, uh, Paz Encina in Paraguay made her Requiem and called it Requiem. You know, 
and exactly talking about the victims of the, of the Chaco Wars and the undead and the unburied and created this just quiet twilight, a requiem of two older people, husband and wife living together across years and years and years. The soundtrack is the dog barking, the birds in the trees, and the sound of water in the stream. There's almost not a word in the entire film. It's an hour and a half long. And it's an old man and an old woman realizing their son is not coming back from the war. And that's the requiem. Mm -hmm. And film just lets you be with them and lets you be with them long enough. I think the entire hour and a half film has maybe 22 cuts. And so you really are with this, again, spaciousness. And you begin to understand things as they begin to understand them. And, um, and someone like Gar Garin Negrujo could make a crazy, wild magic flute where you know, all the stops are pulled out mm -hmm. because he's coming from a Javanese culture that does have that magic and transformation in the Ramayana, in the, the wild images of flames and, and renewal and demons and, uh, uh, and, and, and spirit possession. And so Garin, like Mozart, made sure that his tale of magic was very politically pointed. And you deal with globalization and its consequences in Indonesia. And you deal with the loss of work by craftspeople and everybody being pushed into these factories and farmers no longer being able to farm and the crisis of agriculture all over the world. What is the title of this film? Opera Java. Oh, yes. And You're going to be introducing it. I will introduce it <laughs> in two days. And I mean, one of the touching things about it, someone like Garin, was I've worked with Javanese artists for years and years. The great Javanese uh, dancer, uh, Martinez Morota, who won the trophy as the greatest refined male dancer in Java, has been in four of my productions. And so I've known him across years. And so when we got the treatment for Garin's film, <laughs> it was part one. Miroto. <laughs> and then Echo Suprianto is a dancer from, <coughs> from Borneo, who now is in solo in Java. Wild man. Part two, Echo. <laughs> and basically, because Garin knew I knew these people, he built a film around them mm -hmm. and created, uh, with Opera Java, an amazing act of recovery of the classical arts of Java that needed cinema to reinvent themselves, mm -hmm. and at the same time used those art forms to reinvent cinema. That's good. And, and I would also say with that film, uh, in terms of the Requiem dimension of it, because it, it does, of course, culminate with the, the, the burning of Sita, you know, an a, a intense uh, conflagration, which is done on a beach with no fire, with just fabric. In the spirit of commissioning, Garin commissioned 10 visual artists to create installations, which were his film sets. And so Opera Java has this other dimension, which is just fantastic and surprising. And the locations they filmed on were in central Java. And four weeks after completion of filming, destroyed in the earthquake. Oh. And so the last images of those places are, are in film. this film. And so it also becomes a requiem in another way. New Crown Hope has lots of stories. I could go on and on. Uh, I don't want to take too much of your time. I would just only add one more thing, perhaps, which is um, Baman Gobadi. Um, what a great filmmaker. What a great filmmaker. And uh, in this case, he really pushed himself to the edge. And uh, you know he's always been making these films in this Iran-Iraq border zone where mm -hmm. he spends the film budget rebuilding these villages. <laughs> and then everyone in the village is in the movie. But, <laughs> but the actual use of money <laughs> mm -hmm. is to rebuild the village. And 
you see it and you feel it in these films. These films are such profound acts of recovery. And the tragedy and despair is balanced by this incredible sense that there is something indomitable that will be renewed. Mm -hmm. and, and I think his first film, The Time of the Drunken Horses, was so devastating. And he's really, since then, determined that every film must also have humor and life force mm -hmm. that is unquenchable. Mm -hmm. So that his people, while they wait to have their own nation, do not lose hope. And so these films are such profound documents of a moment of hope against hope. Well, on to uh, theater and opera. Oh, okay. I mean, yes. no, no. really, when people people think of Peter Sellers, they do tend to pigeonhole you a little bit more into those two art forms than into film or video. And it seems that many of your projects, in many of your projects, controversy arises over the supposed free adaptations, particularly in works in theater and uh, opera, the canons. And way back in 1980, when you were only 23, start, your production of Don Giovanni was referred to by the Opera News as an act of artistic vandalism. Those are strong words. Were they apt and how yes, was and the, the <laughs> full quote, which is fantastic, which is a madman running through the Rijksmuseum slashing old master canvases with a razor blade. <laughs> I mean, you know. And this happened in New Hampshire. Yes. This was the Monadnock uh, Music the Festival. The Monadnock Music Festival in the cultural center of Manchester, New Hampshire. So mm -hmm. it was, it was mm -hmm. a high point of my life. And uh, it, it, was, it was fantastic. And to have that kind of response, you, you, it's more than anything you could hope for. You know, <laughs> uh, I mean, that's great ink. Um, the, the, the touching thing about that story is the person who wrote that is a critic named Matthew Gurevich, who just finished writing for the New York Times uh, an amazing article about the making of Dr. Atomic, mm -hmm. where he mm -hmm. could not be more generous to what I'm doing and what its outcome is. And that person has actually gone on such a journey with this body of work in the last 25 years that he is now one of my greatest supporters. Mm -hmm. And I think. You know, that's something that always happens in art. Initially, it's a shock. Initially, you think, what is this that's unimaginable? And of course, those of us who are making it, it's not a shock at all. It's, it's like the next logical step. You know, I'm always amazed because every time I make something, I think, oh, then this is so beautiful. This is so heartfelt. Nobody can miss this. Mm -hmm. And then controversy erupts and giant attacks. And, and you think, now, what? is to not like here. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm still kind of stunned with that kind of response. At the same time, I'm grateful because to me, it's, it is the job description, is if we're really interested in democracy, then you have to insist that there is a discussion. And that which does not need to be discussed does not create democracy, it creates fascism. Right. And discussion is intelligent people saying, well, wait, there's another angle on this. Well, you know, I respect your right to say this, but I do not respect what you've said. Or, you know, th that there's a, a place in which we really do have to deal with this together. And it's not just pat and say, oh, that was lovely. You know, mm -hmm. it's not a consumer product. What we're doing is we are creating a national debate. We are creating something that urgently requires everybody figures out where they stand. You know, and if anything I'm doing is prompting that kind of debate or discussion, that's the job description. Mm -hmm. And I think treating these cultural masterpieces as if they're, you know, kind of a throat lozenge you can take and then it's over, you know, it's the opposite. It's meant to stir you up. It's meant to be unfathomable. And a single Shakespeare speech, not only are you not going to get it that night, but, you know, it's been 500 years people are arguing about what that speech means. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not going to be this is going to be resolved or, mm -hmm. you know, now we've solved it. Oh, thank God. Mm -hmm. What makes Hamlet Hamlet and Don Giovanni Don Giovanni is that we're never going to solve them. They are endlessly this space 
for us to project all of the things that we're wrestling with and we can't resolve. And those things are refracted back to us in a structure that actually holds us to higher standards of how we're treating this material. Mm -hmm. So for me, I embark on these things as a challenge to myself and the people in the room, but also to the audience and to the culture that surrounds us. And yes, it's a challenge. And if critical response frequently shows itself to be challenged, <laughs> that is mm -hmm. because, correct, uh, a challenge is present. And it's an ironic thing that so many critics are in a position of being mouthpieces for kind of the machine that's just grinding things out. And so when you create something that isn't that, it really puts them into a kerfuffle. I mean, they, they can't quite mm -hmm. get their bearings. And at the same time, if I really think about it in a more generous spirit, I would realize that I've worked on this piece for so many years of my life. There is so much in there. I would hate to have to write about it later that night or even the next day. You know, I've actually made something that cannot be digested in that length of time and is not intended to be. And so if someone is showing signs of indigestion because they, they need to write about it the next morning, I actually have to understand that and, and uh, not... Um, well digested is the right. Yeah. It's really what's going on. And of course, for me, you know, in my own life, that, that happens all the time. When I was 18, living in Paris, I saw Patrice Charot's early work. And I hated it. I thought, oh, this is really bad. At one, one show, I wanted my money back. I was so upset. Mm -hmm. And of course, 10 years later, those were the greatest evenings in the theater that I've ever had. I just didn't know it at the time. Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. retrospect, it turned into something that was absolutely defining for me. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's, it's just getting over what people think they're seeing or what, how they think they're responding. It's like in your family. You know, something that the family goes through that's horrible, years later, is what drew everyone together. And you can look back on it as the time everyone came together. Mm -hmm. At the yeah. time, it was not enjoyable. <laughs> And if you said that at the time, someone would punch you in the nose, you know, or it would be cheap and a cheap shot. Mm -hmm. But in fact, later on, you realize we had to go through that. If you asked us at the time, do we ever want to go through anything like this again? The answer is no. But looking back on your life, that was one of the high points. And I feel that theater is like that. You go through things that are, at the time, incomprehensible or unpleasant or strange or off-putting or whatever, but it's actually something to go through. And, and things ultimately shake down in another way. And then uh, maybe I can just put it yet one more, respond to it yet one more way, which is my feeling of what I do is it's not about what I do. It's about creating something that empowers everyone else in the room to go to where they need to go. Mm -hmm. And so if somebody sees a show, I don't really care what anybody says that night or in intermission because that's usually useless. And I, in my own life, I refuse to talk about something at intermission or afterwards because I know that later you'll only remember what you said at intermission rather than what you saw. <laughs> so I, I actually resist and I talk about anything else. But the next morning, you get on the phone and you call a friend. And you say, I saw the worst thing. And goes, mm, and that's a half hour. Or you say, last time I saw something so beautiful. No, you, and it's a half hour. Mm -hmm. It's the same half hour. Mm -hmm. And then this person who never saw it is imagining it. This person who saw it themselves becomes a creative artist telling a story. Interpreting. The, the, the word interpreting is what interests me. It's a powerful word. Uh, and then, and then, if I could just say, con conjugating it out, obviously the person who never saw it then calls another friend mm -hmm. and talks about something they never saw. And yes. for me, that's the power of what we do, is it moves differently from the marketing campaign. 
You know, it's, an, it's person to person. It's someone you care about. So the level of communication is very intense and real. And the stakes are high. I love that. <laughs> Last night, um, I uh, um, heard a recording of a, uh, uh, a speech, uh, or interview, rather, with the silent film director, Marcel Lerbier. Uh, he's no longer living. This I is, know, this I know, is, yes. And uh, it was in reference to his film, L'Argent, which uh, between us is going to be shown at Telluride this year. Uh, what he said was, uh, I thought it was a wonderful thought, all great works of art are adaptations. Uh, That's beautiful. Let's think about Shakespeare and, and the classics in those terms. What do you think? of? First of all, was Shakespeare himself a plagiarist? Yes. As you know, and my yeah, obsession yeah, is, yeah. you know, <laughs> Shakespeare would not survive copyright or intellectual property law. Right. Because every single Shakespeare play is lifted from usually more than one source. Mm -hmm. But frequently entire paragraphs will just be moved over into Shakespeare's play and he'll change three or four words. But the, the need to devour everything around us, that's what we're doing. That's what we're, and we're processing it and we're internalizing it and we're making it our own. And that's of course the whole point is that when we, you see a great production of Hamlet, you're not thinking, oh gee, that's what they were thinking in the 17th century. Mm -hmm. You're actually in front of your own questions about life. You're actually in front of the contradictions that are surrounding us today. You're in front of everything on your mind. Not, gee, what was Shakespeare thinking? Mm -hmm. You know, the, right. any great work of art is more than its creator imagined. And that's its measure of greatness. The ones that are just what the creator thought they were <laughs> die with their age <laughs> because they don't have a life beyond this particular context. Whereas the, the masterpieces live in every context and relive in every context and recreate themselves in every context and actually cause every context to be reinvented. Mm -hmm. And that's thrilling. And, 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 and the power of Hamlet is not that there's a definitive Hamlet. It's that every generation found their Hamlet, you know. And There's no Hamlet for the ages. No, for it's, all ages. You know, and 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 you know, for so many people, those Olivier films are now embarrassing, you know, mm -hmm. which we thought were, you know, were for the ages, and then time is not kind. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's like what we were wearing in 1973. Well, okay, <laughs> yeah. you don't really want to go there. Uh, uh, no. And and so, I, I think I think it's. Um, I think the job description is to engage as fully as possible and to personalize everything around you. You know, is to really make it a personal stake and not to say, oh, this doesn't involve me, my fingerprints aren't on it, but to actually say this does involve me, I'm implicated, everything I am is implicated in this. And to work that implication out as fully as you can and the point of art is to actually put a face on the faceless world, not to keep it faceless. You know, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, and if it's a mirror, then you've got to really figure out, because a mirror also is a reciprocal relationship. You've got to look very deeply into that mirror. And you also have to make sure you're offering certain things to that mirror that let it become a full mirror. What am I really holding up to Shakespeare that Shakespeare can reflect? How extensive is my research going to be into Shakespeare's text to see how many things are in that mirror, but also into my world to see how many things in this world can show up in that mirror? Mm -hmm. And so it involves deep looking in both directions. Right. And ultimately, as we were saying with Tchaikovsky, it's not a question of the surface of the world. It's a question of the depths. The surface is not so important. 
And one of the reasons I make all my shows in contemporary costumes is so we don't have to worry about that. We got that. Okay, great. Now mm -hmm. what? Mm -hmm. Who are these people? Yeah. You know, but I don't have to fuss with the act of imagination of, oh, in the 18th century they did this. Because for me, audiences right now don't know that. You know, I'm in front of audiences in the age of information that have no education. And that really don't know what they did in the 18th century. And so I could kill myself putting some <coughs> elaborate 18th century construction on stage. And it would be absolutely illegible to the audience today. Mm -hmm. And so the reason I when I'm doing opera, I usually use these images from TV is because the audience recognizes them. But then Mozart and Shakespeare explode the television image because the television image can't contain them because there's so much more to life than there is to television. And to watch that television explode every time mm -hmm. as life insists on pouring through, as the poetry elevates and destroys that image. Well, that's a joy. <laughs> well, Peter, you're here as part of the Class Divide Initiative at the Hopkins Center. I mean, that's, I think that's one of the things yes, that yes, got you interested yes, yes, in absolutely. coming for the uh, Montgomery Endowment. And frankly, this issue of Class Divide has become so much more meaningful than when you first signed on to come right. here. These last few months mm -hmm. uh, is what I'm talking right. about. Um, first of all, what do you think of that project uh, at Dartmouth today? Uh, I, I, personally, I think it fits in beautifully with the course you teach at UCLA on yes. art and moral action and art and social yes. action. Um, and maybe you should also say how this might tie into your lecture tomorrow. Is that too much to ask? Mm, the suspense is terrific. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, one of the things that I think it's fair to start with always is you know what makes America unique in the history of all countries in the world is the statement of all human beings are created equal. Mm -hmm. What does equality mean? On what basis do we define equality? Of course, the other new uh, constitution is the South African Constitution, which written by a group of people including Albie Sachs actually goes even farther and thank God for it in our lifetime. Um, but just to start with the promise of this country, which is equality. And equality has a long, long history. Uh, you know, the Bhagavad Gita, the sixth chapter, is about the eye of equality. <coughs> what does it mean that equality is in the eye? That you look at somebody in such a way as you recognize their equality. And so for me, the project of looking, that it is in the eye, is really, really important. And what we're here to do as artists is to teach people how to look in order to see equality. Where one way of looking shows you deep, profound, asymmetrical inequities. And maybe you've translated that, that into these are bad people and these are the good people. <laughs> to quote our previous president. Or maybe you're actually able to see in the bad people that they're also people. And maybe you're able to see in the good people that they have some real problems. And they are really wrestling. Maybe you begin to look in such a way that you're understanding that nobody is who they appear to be on the surface. That everybody is about three shelves of Tolstoy novels, <laughs> to say the least. Spiritual crises, the whole range. And you can't even possibly know who somebody is, who you think they are. Because, of course, they're still struggling with who they are. Let alone what you can perceive is so rich, is so alive is so in motion, moment to moment, for each of us. And to understand this uh, eye of equality being, um, again, I keep going back to film, but you know, theater and visual arts, everything is connected with this. But this idea of looking, um, you know, Jesus says, if you look at somebody, 
and you think that fool, you will burn in hell. It's worse than murdering them. To actually take a knife and slit their throat is redundant. And that, in fact, the eye is the murderer. And the violence is in the eye. Cultures all over the world have the evil eye. You know, which is the idea of just the act of looking has already done the damage. You know, you say, okay, you are the welfare recipient and I am here to supervise your poverty program. <laughs> you know, automatically, a whole set of things happen, a whole set of assumptions how one person looks at another, and the damage is done. And it's violent. It's very violent. And what does it mean to learn to look another way, as in a Satyajit Ray film, where somebody who you didn't have time for, mm -hmm. you suddenly look at, and you see in this inconsequential, nameless person, universes opening. And you begin to recognize that the surfaces aren't telling you much, and that there's a whole other resonance about our being together. And if you're still living life manipulating those surfaces, you're missing it. And if the only thing you can think of is we're going to change this surface to that one, <laughs> it's a rather pathetic idea of change, social change or indeed personal transformation. And what we're talking about is empowerment. And empowerment needs to happen to people who have money and who have no money. Empowerment is the place in which we're all equal. Empowerment is the place where people realize their actual worth, which is not a number assigned from outside. And the eye of equality in, in, in Hindu tradition, it's called darshan, and it's, uh, it's the prayer where you are seen by the deity and the deity, you see the deity and the deity sees you. It's this exchange and meeting of the glance, and it's the gaze of love. And the gaze of love you know from the person at home who you share your life with is you can walk in after the worst day in the world and they look at you with a gaze of love. And that absolutely changes who you are and how you're feeling. And you look back at them with a gaze of love. <laughs> and yes, there's transformation. <laughs> yes. It's deep, deep transformation. It's the gaze of love. It's this mutual darshan. And um, and of course, the greatness of cinema is that gaze of love. The greatness of visual art is that gaze of love. The greatness of classical Sanskrit Indian drama is all about the gaze of love. Japanese no plays, it's after two hours, the two characters finally, they've been at all these angles, and they finally turn and actually see each other for the first time. And that's really what we're all doing on this journey is finally the moment will come where we actually turn and see each other for the first time. Peter, thank you for coming. To oh, no, being it's with my, us. my joy to be what, here. What a wonderful Bill, how beautiful to be with you. Wow. What a morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness.